Using Our Influence is a rural collaborative of women leaders working since 2009 to change the ways violence shows up in our communities. We work in women's organizations, education, and health. As Nova Scotians, we continue to struggle with the trauma of the mass shooting of April 18th and 19th. This terrible event was followed by a series of tragic incidents that added to our collective pain. All of this while we are in a state of emergency due to the coronavirus pandemic. We are women who work toward the goal of ending violence against women and girls. We see the world through our experiences, both personal and professional. We understand that every person has their own experiences that shape their view of the world. We wish we knew why the mass shooting happened in order to ensure this never happens again to anyone, anywhere. We feel sorrow, frustration, and anger. We work toward finding opportunity as a way to find hope. We believe that hope is where creativity and innovation live. Without hope, there is no way to move forward. We also understand that to hope is to be vulnerable. The pandemic has made us all feel vulnerable. We have protected ourselves by staying apart. To heal from trauma, we must be connected. We decided to start with ourselves. We started by reaching out to each other on the phone and video chat platforms. We asked ourselves, how do we turn the unspeakable into something we can proactively speak about? Restrictions have just been lifted enough that we can carefully gather with appropriate distancing to make this video. We hope you will find our observations helpful in your journey toward deeper understanding of why. Thank you for joining us to explore when each of us have been part of creating a space of safety and connection where experiences of violence against women and girls can be prevented, heard, or healed. Joy, how have you been part of creating a space of safety and connection where experiences of violence against women and girls can be prevented, heard, or healed? Thanks, Gwen. I'm going to tell a story and I have worked for over 30 years with women and women's issues and heard many things um, around violence against women and abuse. Never is it easy to hear that, but one particular incident stands out for me and I'm going to relay some of that and then try and answer the question that you gave me. So this story begins with a phone call that I received from a woman and she asked me to meet her and wanted to relay what her experiences had been as a child. And she wanted, what she was looking for was some retribution for what she had experienced. So anyway, here we go. I met with this woman, a young woman, and she had experienced abuse and violence like I had never heard before. And I'd heard many, many stories before. But this one was the most extreme that I had ever heard. So I sat with her and I listened to the story that she gave me that as a child she had been abused and violated by a perpetrator and she now the perpetrator had died and she had the courage and the safety and the strength to come forward and address some of the things that had been done to her and she was on a journey of healing I believe. It was not against the perpetrator that she was looking for retribution I think she felt that in her mind that had happened with the demise, with his death. What she was looking for was retribution from a family physician that over the years she had been taken to with multiple infections and was always just given a prescription and this was a child under the age of six. And these infections were ongoing and the physician never bothered to look any further, whether it was lack of time, couldn't be bothered, or actually wanting to ignore the fact, I don't know that. But she felt that she wanted some retribution for herself 
and to bring light into the idea that when these things happen, physicians need to be aware and search further. So I sat and listened to this and inside my brain was firing like crazy because what she talked about was so horrific that I could not possibly imagine that one individual could do this to another individual, especially a child. And I had to gain every bit of strength that I had to sit and not look absolutely horrified or react that way to what she was telling me because the horror of it was something that you would think you would see in a horror film that wasn't real. And I had to be empathetic and I had also to be objective. So I did, I listened and we went through all the emotional experiences or she did that you would think that she would but also the strength and the resilience that I saw in her from what she had experienced was uplifting to me in the way that someone could actually survive and continue to survive in that situation. Anyway, um, as an end to that story, the physician, uh, it was taken further. Um, I had to take it to my supervisors and anyway, long story short, it was taken through the appropriate channels and the physician was actually taken to task for what had happened. I believe the young woman felt some justification and some kind of closure to that part of her story. And I'm not gonna say it was an end. I think for her, it was probably a beginning. Um, of a new portion of her life, a new section of her life, and a way to at least close that part of the book on that journey that she had had. So I never want to say that it was my best in doing anything, because I don't think in any of the work that I've ever done, I've looked at it as a personal thing. It's always been a collective of how I've moved forward with other always women to try and alleviate some of the pain and the suffering and the issues that go along with our daily lives. So that's my story. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm hearing that your willingness and the woman's willingness to come together to sit down and talk is something that that help both of you create a sense of safety and connection in that moment. Would you say anything more about that? People believing and hearing what this woman said wow. and taking the honesty from that and, and not, because the courage that she took to bring this forward was beyond anything I could ever imagine. And I think just that idea of being heard and then pursuing that a little further was part of that healing process for her. So when we think about opportunities for hope and resilience, it sounds like you're saying that that opportunity to tell that story and then have someone follow up was really pow a powerful opportunity for her for hope and resili resilience. But you also talk about how her resilience really struck you in terms of just her strength of coming forward can you, can you talk a little bit about how this story might create opportunities for hope and res resilience for others? I think just the idea that it was so horrific what she had experienced as a child that I think a lot of people would have just completely shut down and never wanted to address it again, but her willingness to be able to actually look at it and do that self journey for her own healing is so important for all of us and to be able to see that in someone it gives you that that spark of saying okay if i need to do this i can follow a path similar to this woman did to f to get that resilience 
And if you have others that can support you and hold you up to be able to do that, I think that's so important because often we are isolated, we are on our own, and we need that bit of support and guidance and hand-holding to be able to bring that out. Thank you. And often, especially for us as women, we often um, minimize our role in, in being support. So I wonder, what do you most value about yourself in this story? Hmm. My ability to not break down completely when I was hearing things that uh, were unimaginable, absolutely unimaginable for a child to go through. And I have children. I can't imagine what this young woman went through if I, in, if I personalize it to my own. I, I just, beyond all comparison to anything. Um, I think I lost your question, but... <laughs> what you value most about yourself. I'm hearing that you really value your ability to really be present for her. Be present for her and believe in her and be honest with her. Um, there was no false hope. It wasn't like I said, oh, yes, this will all go away and no pie in the sky. Mm -hmm. But the reality of we'll try and see what can happen. We'll push this through a little bit fur further and further to try and resolve and get to a point that you want, not what I want, but what you want. Um, and just listening to her, just being there. Thank you very much, Joy. Thanks, Gwen. Hi, Flo. Could you tell us a story about a time when you've been a part of creating a space of safety and connection, sorry, a space of safety and connection where experiences of violence against women and girls can be prevented, heard, or healed? Hi, Gwen. Um, as part of my work uh, for the past 14 years, we've been bringing women and children together uh, for an art program. Uh, they come together to create art and express themselves and, and begin their journey towards healing. So we decided it was quite vital, since we couldn't get together any longer, to be able to continue offering what's at the heart of that art program. And that's a sense of community, uh, safety, of connection, where women are heard and supported. So we decided we'd take art bags to them on a weekly basis and drop it off on their doorsteps. And throughout the isolation and the despair and the grief that we were all experiencing from the pandemic and then the mass shootings, we realized it was even more important to continue bringing this to these families. They needed that sense of connection and that sense of caring. So on one day, as I'm dropping off my bags, this mom came to the door and opened the door and come flying past her was her little five-year-old boy who ran down the driveway and threw his arms around me. We hugged for a long time, and that hug said a lot. The sense of safety that that little boy must have felt to be able to come and run out to me. So we hugged, and there was hope and healing in that hug. His mom stood there at the doorway calmly and watched him run right past her. And so in that moment, I realized that sense of connection and, and safety and caring that we were providing these families on a weekly basis. We were now bringing it right to their doorsteps. They were still having that sense of connection and and, and caring, and they felt safe. Uh, 
I, I came to this work because I grew up in a home with violence and abuse. And it's always been very important to me to make sure that women and children who have experienced violence and abuse are supported and cared for and heard. So I approach my work every day with that intention. And I've always been able to look at the little things. That little act of dropping off these art bags every week created an opportunity for hope and resilience. And I do know that it is the little things that make the difference. Growing up, it was the little things that helped me through. The little things from my mom making sure I had coloring pencils so I could express my turmoil through art and begin my journey of healing. The neighbors who opened their doors to us in the middle of the night so we could come and be safe. The teenager who lived across the street who would come and pick me up and paint my nails, take me to the store for a bag of chips. The women in my neighborhood that would invite me into their homes and sit me in their rocking chairs and let me sit there and cry and talk about what was going on. All those little acts fostered resilience in me and gave me the strength to be able to continue offering that to women and children through my work for the past 28 years. Thank you so much, Flo. So you talked a lot about how the small things, the little things, could, could help create safety and connection. Is there anything more you want to say about that? About you, you really told two stories. You told your story and you told the story of the little boy. So I'm wondering if there's anything more you want to say about creating safety and connection. I just feel that each and every one of us every day can offer that sense of safety and connection. And it doesn't have to be any great big thing. It just needs to be one little small act. Which kind of ties right into the next question, which is how did the story create opportunities for hope and resilience? And it seems like those small acts can, can spawn all kinds of opportunity for hope and resilience. Do you have anything more you want to say about that? I think that what is going on in our world now is a sign that we need to focus a little bit more on hope and resilience. We all need that. And to be able to move forward to a world where women and children can be safe and not have to go through the horrific things they go through, I think that that's, that's at the base of it all. That's the heart of, of the work we do, offering hope and resilience creating those opportunities, caring. And so if you were to highlight, often, especially for us as women, we have trouble seeing what we bring to these conversations or what we can bring to create that hope and resilience. What do you most value about yourself and what you bring? 
I think what I value most about myself is that I'm able to I'm able to look at everybody through that same lens. And that's a lens of caring. Just caring. Wanting to hear, wanting to listen, wanting to support, wanting to celebrate, or just share. Share the grief, share the happiness. Just be there. Thank you so much, Flo. I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. Thank you, Gwen. Hi, Ginger. Can you tell us a story about a time when you have been part of creating a space of safety and connection where experiences of violence against women and girls can, can be prevented, heard, or healed? So for me, uh, creating that safe space is about um, taking down the facade that we all have a perfect life, that we all um, have moments where we don't feel 100%, where we um, struggle with things, uh, because we tend to not talk about those struggles. And it's difficult when we're talking about particularly a complex issue like violence against women to understand the complexity behind what makes a woman stay, why doesn't a woman, you know, see the abuse at the beginning, why, uh, why do events like the mass shooting um, start with an act of domestic violence. And so the dispute over those topics is particularly uh, troubling to me. And, and I think that a lot of the reasons are because we don't openly talk about the reality of, of these difficult topics. People don't want to talk about something that's uh, difficult. They want to find a simple, short answer, something to blame it on and move on. And so uh, the stories that I have two stories that I want to share that, uh, that are about different people, but they interconnect. Um, and the first is, it's, they're both my stories, but the first is when I was 18. I was living on my own, and I was in a relationship that I started to uh, become fearful in the relationship. It wasn't physically violent at that point, but I had decided that I needed to end that relationship. And I somehow knew that it wasn't going to be safe for me to do that in person. So I had left my own apartment for the night and uh, left a note to make sure that, that I wasn't around and uh, that I would be safe that night. And when I returned home, the uh, police were in my driveway. And so immediately as I saw them there, I knew it had something to do with this. And uh, so my boyfriend at the time had completely smashed the vehicle of the people that lived above me, people that I didn't know, people that I had no relationship with, um, and that was about his anger towards me. And so when I went down into my apartment, there was a, a large knife in the door and a note, uh, and the note led me to believe that he may have harmed himself or something. So I went upstairs and got the police to come down and enter the apartment with me. Everything in the apartment, literally everything in the apartment was smashed, torn, shredded, whatever destruction was possible was, was done in that apartment. There was pieces of glass hanging out of the wall. It was a violent, uh, scene and it was um, pretty devastating to me and so the police response was that there was nothing that they could do about that that was a civil matter and the the act of violence against the neighbors upstairs was just seen as property destruction so in this instance um, you know what what I saw was how suddenly something that was about me actually put harm to other people around me. And that was what really struck me. And 
um, that is ultimately what led me to stay in that relationship for for quite some time because I was afraid, of course, at this point, if I tried to leave again, who would get harmed and um, and what, you know, what is the next level after that? That was a pretty extreme response to something. So eventually, um, you know, years later, a different relationship, I'm with someone and we have a, a, an argument about something. So in this instance, uh, I hadn't ended the relationship because keeping in mind, you know, this incident that I just described and other incidents in my past led me to believe that I needed to do everything to make things okay and to keep the peace. And so after we had this, this disagreement, I had gone to work. He decided to go to a friend's house and drink. And then he came to pick me up. And at this point, I was three months pregnant with my daughter. And so he came drunk to pick me up and on his way he hit and killed a man um, just, you know, feet from where I worked. And that incident was seen as dangerous driving causing death. There was never a connection between here's an incident that began with an act of domestic violence and, uh, and a repeated pattern of domestic violence. And of course, the first thing that he told me after this incident happened was that the death of this man was my fault because I was the one that upset him and I was the one that led him to drink and, and that's why that, that happened. So um, as you might imagine, that's a pretty devastating thing to live with to have witnessed, you know, people that are, people that you don't know, people that are innocent, people that have nothing to do with your relationship, being harmed and having their lives impacted in a way that, you know, you could have never imagined happening. And then carrying that feeling with you. And so, you know, when I look at the debate that happened around the mass shooting and the arguments over, you know, there were, you know, arguments over whether it was domestic violence or not and how we could call it domestic violence when other people were harmed, when men were harmed. And so the reason that I share these two stories is, is first because obviously it's very complex for a woman uh, who's in an abusive relationship when she's trying to protect people around her and trying to figure out what the right thing to do is in order to keep people safe. And the, the second piece is understanding that there are many things that happen that maybe the police or the media or the community members don't necessarily connect back to an act of domestic violence when there is actually a pattern uh, and, and repeated behaviors that impact that. And so, you know, and I think we often don't talk about these situations because, first of all, they're, they're embarrassing, uh, uh, they're humiliating, and, um, and they're painful to think about. So, but if we don't create spaces where we can, you know, have open discussions about these difficult conversations, and if we don't open up about uh, how we can, how something can lead to those kind of situations, then we really have a lack of awareness uh, among our community members to understand why all of these things connect. And so, you know, for me, sharing these stories is about understanding that, you know, these are incidents that go back to when I was a teenager that have shaped and formed how I look at relationships, how I respond to relationships, and how I, um, you know, interact with the community. And a lot of those, a lot of those stories are things that we're taught not to share and we're taught to be ashamed of. And, and then other women, um, feel the same way. So it, it, it's, to me, something that uh, one of the women that we work with, 
once said to me when she realized that I had been a, a resident of the shelter and now I'm you know in in the position of being the director of the shelter um, she said to me you know when she realized that wow that's so powerful for me for me to see you in that role gives me hope for me to understand that you've had struggles and you've overcome them gives me hope and um, and so why don't you talk about that was her question to me. Why don't you share that with people? And the reason that I hadn't shared it with people was because a lot of times I was told not not to in community settings where they people felt uncomfortable talking about it, right? So for me, um, having that dialogue is really important and being open and honest about where I've come from and the struggles that I've been through are hopefully what will create an atmosphere where women feel safe talking about the struggles that they've been through. Thank you so much. Um, so much about what you've said really answers my first question, which is about um, what is it about the stories that you've told that help create safety and connection? And what I, what I hear is that the act of sitting here right now telling us these stories is you reaching out beyond the camera to to try to create safety and connection. Is there anything more you want to say about that? Yeah, I, th I mean, I, I think that there have been a number of times over the years that I have attempted to, to do that, to share. Um, it isn't always met <laughs> well, um, and so sometimes that has stopped me from sharing. Um, I think that uh, we also have to remember that when we speak to media, they're short sound bites, they're, they're little pieces of the story that aren't necessarily um, giving you the depth of, of, what, of what the story is and why it's important. And so I think that, uh, that having, a, having the ability to actually tell the story in your own words uh, in a, in a full and meaningful way makes a difference as well and and so I think that is something that enables a better a better outcome for for those of us who are willing to share our stories and as you reflect on the story um, what are the opportunities that um, you could pinpoint, if you could point at something or if you could point even now in your thinking, what are the opportunities for hope and resilience in the stories that you told? Uh, I think that there, I think there have been many opportunities that, that have been presented to me by people listening to, to what I had to share, by helping me understand that, um, that those acts were not actually acts that I am responsible for. Um, and I think that we still see that messaging happening regularly where there's a look for blame on someone uh, rather than understanding that these are complex issues and that there are a lot of factors that, that come into these situations and, uh, and that when often women are blamed for for these actions, we do not bear responsibility for other people's actions. And uh, so I think that, you know, the hope comes for others understanding that, you know, we all have challenges that we have to face and we all have, you know, made choices in our lives that maybe we're not um, feeling great about after we've made them that doesn't identify us or define us for the rest of our lives. We can move forward and we can, you know, do something different to, to change our lives and to move forward. And for you in particular to have gone from being a, a participant at the shelter to being the director, is there something about resilience that you would speak to in that? Has there been things along the way? What has helped? build that resilience or made that possible for you? I think, you know, being at the shelter um, is 
you know, completely a defining moment in my life. It was the first time I was around women who listened to me, who didn't judge what had happened in my life. They held space for me when I needed it. They supported me and they empowered me and taught me that I had the ability to do whatever I wanted to do. Um, and so, you know, the whole core of, of that work within the shelter is based on, you know, hope and resilience. Everything that, everything that is, is taught there, everything that is happening within that environment, uh, you know, sort of envelops us with those, those possibilities. And obviously what we choose to do with it matters but that support there is there and that hope is there. And, um, you know, had I not had women who listened and told me that I could do anything that I wanted to do, um, my life would have gone down a completely different path. And as you look back on that life and on those stories, what do you most value about yourself in those stories? Oh, I think, you know, for me, what's, What's most important to me is the authenticity of accepting who I am with my flaws and my mistakes and all, and um, and just being able to be, you know, to be open and honest and real about who I am is very important to me, and I hope that 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 ability to share that when I'm working with other women allows them to be who they are as well. Especially given that we have so much pressure to be perfect and to have everything figured out and to have, um, you know, never have bad days and never have, you know, moments where we don't have it all together. I, I think we have to allow each other to be, to be real and be authentic. Thank you so much, Ginger. That was that was great to hear those stories. Thank you. Hi, Rhonda. Hi. Can you share with us a story about how you have been part of creating a space of safety and connection where experiences of violence against women and girls can be prevented, heard, or healed? Whenever I'm asked to talk about my work with shelters and my work with, with women who have experienced violence and abuse, I always come back to the same story. And this story is well over 20 years old now. And it has taken me a really long time to figure out why, for me, it always comes back to this story. Because on the surface, there's not a direct connection. I think, uh, in, in this story. So it was um, Christmas, and at the time, I, uh, at, at home, I had in my own personal life, pretty much all boys. Because in my personal life, I'm surrounded by men and boys. And in my professional life, I'm surrounded largely with women. So I realized years later that maybe that's why this story is always the story. So it was Christmas time. I was working overnight Christmas Eve at the shelter and we were full. We were very full, which um, it has its own layers when, when we think about it. So on Christmas Eve, what would happen is Santa would come to the shelter and the children would be very excited about this. Uh, the moms for whom you can imagine how difficult it would be to be at the shelter Christmas Eve on your own, let alone with your children. Um, so it, it would provide sort of that bit of light in the middle of what could really be a very sad and tragic situation. So Santa arrived with with his helper and was in the living room. And I realized that in the middle of all of the hubbub and the music and the candies, that somebody was missing. So I went across the hall and there was this little guy. 
He was, I'm, he was six, seven years old at the time, and he was a tough little fella. And I went in and I said, are you going to come over to the living room to, to see Santa and to be with everybody? And he said, Christmas is stupid. I'm not coming over there. That's not Santa. and I'm not coming out. And I said, okay, you don't have to come out, but maybe you could come over with me because I have to go over. So would you come with me? Because I don't know if I really want to go. So maybe if we both go, then that'll be better for both of us. Okay, he says, kind of begrudgingly. So we go over. He walks in the door of the living room, and the next thing I know, he is wrapped around the neck of Santa. He is clinging like his life depends on it, crying and saying, I knew you were real. <sighs> so, it's not about Santa. It's not about Christmas. It's not about me. It's not really even about the little boy. Um, that is the story I always tell. Because what that story is about for me is that nothing is about one thing. It is always about the right collection of things at the right time. It's always about vulnerability. It's always about how we share with each other in the simplest moments. And maybe more importantly, in the moments that we perceive or assume are sad or bad or horrific, there are always opportunities for moments to deeply connect with each other over things that it would be so easy to say don't matter, but those things do matter. And what mattered in that moment was everyone in that room was there with a vulnerability. Everyone in that room was in tears. Every mother, every child, the volunteers in the room, myself. Because in that moment, I think everyone recognized that we're all just bumbling through the best way we know how. And as someone who over the last 25 years has often been asked for my opinion about things related to violence against women, um, I always come back to bumbling through the best way we know how because none of us has all the answers and none of us will ever have all of the answers. But what we can have is an, an openness to that vulnerability to find those moments to connect. And when I started telling this story, you know, I, I said in my personal life, I spend a lot of time with, well, now men. And um, in my professional life, I spend most of my time with women. And when I reflect on the COVID pandemic and I reflect on the mass shooting and I could keep going because there, there are so many people who have lived in tragedy or died in tragedy and continue to experience tragedy. And it's so um, easy in a way to say this person or this group of people is all bad, they're the problem. Or, well, this group of people they're, they're the answer. They have the answers. They're all good. And neither one of those answers is ever right. And it's, I, I think that when we talk about violence against women, and when I tell the story of the little boy, 
What I want people to hear is, this isn't about women. This isn't about men. It isn't about girls. It isn't about boys. It isn't, it isn't about any one particular group of people because until everybody is safe, nobody is safe. So what, for me, what the story shows is that we all need to be available to say, I don't know, but I'm willing to try to talk to you to try to figure it out. Wow. So you talk a lot about safety, connection, and you've brought in the term vulnerability. And so when we think about the story of the little boy and the, the wealth of stories you have in your experience, what do you think helps create safety and connection and how does vulnerability tie into that? I think that um, vulnerability should walk with us whenever we're trying to find answers to really tough questions. Because if we're not vulnerable, then we're not open to hear all of the nuance and all of the layers and all of the possibilities. And I think vulnerability keeps us in a place where we can understand that many, many things can all exist at the same time. So most often in my experience and in my life, no wonderful situation is ever about one thing, nor is any tragic situation ever about one thing. And vulnerability allows us to see the layers. And so if we think about vulnerability helping us see the layers, um, enable, to, to, to enable um, that journey to safety and connection, what are the opportunities for hope and resilience in that? I think the opportunities are if we are willing to listen deeply and be vulnerable, we are going to learn, but we're also going to hold space for other people to be heard. And often, when people wish to be heard, they will either be silent or they will scream. There's very little in between. And if we spent more time in the in between, I think we could lessen the amount of silence and screaming. Wow. So as you think about the story with the little boy, as you think about holding that space to lessen the silence and the screaming, what do you most value about yourself in that? What I'm a, in that story and at other times, the, the thing I value most about myself that is really hard work most of the time is maintaining that I don't know. Because most of the time, I, I might have an answer, but I rarely, if ever, have the answer. And I value that I work at that. And it's hard work. And I think for those of us who um, have worked in this field for a long time, have been seen as experts in our fields, um, it's hard to find a space where it's safe to say, I don't know. But the more we say that, um, the more freedom we have to talk about how it is not just for us, but for other folks as well, and to invite other folks to say, guess what? I don't know either, so let's talk about it and maybe we'll find something out. Thank you, Rhonda. Hi, Dale. Can you tell us a story about how you have been part 
of creating a space of safety and connection where experiences of violence against women and girls can be prevented, heard, or healed. Hmm. Thank you, Gwen. Um, hmm. I came prepared with one story, and as I sit and I've listened to the women who've shared before me, I've come up with different ideas and thoughts. Like, um, that's not a really easy question to answer, but yet it's so easy in other ways. Um, you know, when I think about my own past and my own life, it's really hard for me to, the way I think, to actually consider that I, I, I've, in essence, done a lot of stuff in terms of um, supporting people around these issues. But yet, I'm faced with the fact as a professional woman, as so many of the women who've spoken before me, that we've done an, an awful lot of things on a collective level. Because, of course, as you know, or many people know, um, in this room anyway, um, I've been involved with all kinds of things, like tra building a trauma-informed practice framework, looking at training for people around sexualized violence, sitting on boards. But having said that, I don't know if that's where I would think that the biggest sto story, if that's the right word, story, comes from. Because I think about, and I thought of this over there, was that it's with my students. When I think about how I teach and how I've changed the way I teach and how I facilitate in the last decade and how that's changed, because as I was contemplating the question about what I do and a space, is that it's my hope that as I facilitate learning experiences with my young students, most of them are young, that I create an environment where they're able to start seeing the positive within themselves. Because I'm aware, I don't, I don't set up the classroom so the students come in and share these stories with me of their lives, but I know enough about trauma awareness to, to know what's going on when people walk in into my classroom. And I, I, I set up an, ex, an environment so students can start seeing who they are, so that they can start seeing the and in the language, self-efficacy and self-confidence. In other words, so that they can see themselves for the wonderful human beings they are and be able to take the positiveness of who they are and bring it into the world. Oh, I'm going to cry with that. Okay? Because I think the story is, is a big story of the teaching, but also a smaller piece of it is each of my students who come into my classroom. And I know you asked for one story, but my story would be a conglomeration of the stories of my students. I can just think of, through the years, how many have come my way. Um, I'm privileged to support them. And as they work their way through the journey of my classroom, leave with skills. And I think the biggest skill is their ability to see themselves as who they really are as they share themselves within my classroom, you know? And I set up environments so that they can share pieces of themselves so that they can claim back and then be able to go into the world because they've all come to me for that. So my stories and the stories I tell are perhaps the way my students come to me and I create an environment so they can be more of who they are and go into the world. And when I think of that, maybe my classroom is a year of building resiliency for them so that they have a good board to start with. I'm gonna say, I was gonna say a, a, a swimming board where you jump off into the deep end because when you start a career, that's the way it is. You, you're jumping off the board not knowing, and you take what you have with you. And then I've been privileged to watch that and be invited into their worlds to help them that way. And I think when we think about the storytelling, that it's not just the story of them, but a story of my, mine. As I watched my 20 years in the classroom, I also see that my own resilience has increased as, there, as, I, as I've gone that journey with them, you see? Because it's a two-way process. As we walk into the world, 
And I, as I walk into the world, I often use the word we because I'm an educator. And it's what you do when you teach we, we, so that the students are brought into the story. But as I have walked with them alongside and sometimes carrying them along the process, I see the resilience of everyone around me increasing. As I use appreciative statements with them and I build a classroom. Because my sense is as we work, walk together on this journey of healing and provide space for those around us, is that it's not the big things that are actually create the most healing, although I think it's important we do them, that we have to have frameworks and we've got to have um, strategic plans, and I've been involved in a lot of that, but also it's the interaction one-on-one -on -one so that a person feels valued and they're heard. So it's a conglomeration of daily stories that are ongoing. And it's not the big things. It's the making sure that I ask students, so what happened this weekend? What was good? Or if you're in my classroom at the end of the year, at the end of each week now, and I've done this for several years now, I don't let them leave unless they tell me to identify something that was good for them that week. What was something that was positive? What, what, what do they find out about themselves that was helpful? So I think that those are what leads it together. Not necessarily the big stuff, but boiling it down to everyday moments. Thank you, Dale. So I know that you're a, a college instructor and that you work with young adults yes. by and large. Most 90% of them are under 25, I think. And, and what, I, what I've heard you say is that you hold a space for them where they can learn to be their best selves. That is my hope, yes. And so in doing that, can you tell us a little bit about what helps create the safety and connection for them to be their, their best selves? Well, to create the space so that the students can be their best selves, it's first of all, creating safety so they can. Creating a, an environment where maybe a little different than when I was educated, okay? Uh, but a space where they know I'm not going to attack them and I'm not going to judge them and that we can have a dialogue. So it's a trusting environment where they're able to take, try different hats on and do things differently and be able to fall and stumble and still pick themselves up and sometimes I go over and pick themselves and help them up, okay, as, an, as, a, um, as a facilitator does, but creating that safety so that they know that they can continue on. And within that is to create choices. As an educator, you come into my classroom, you've got a lot of choices, and if you don't like the way I've set up the class with these assignments, you just create your own, and you just propose it to me. So choices, connection, collaboration, and really doing it, not just using words, because there's a difference between saying these words, and I know for myself, I certainly can write an essay with all of this in it, all right? However, it's doing it. As I put in a video this morning, and one of the things for my students is that the best way to know me is by how I treat you, not necessarily what I say to you. So the best way I can teach my students is the way I treat them, not by what, just the content. Although, having said that, any future students, content's important. <laughs> but content comes and goes in many ways. The process of compassion, kindness, choice, connection, collaboration, and above all, compassion. So you said a word earlier, a couple of words, um, that I haven't heard yet in these stories. One is you talked about trust, which I think is very interesting. I mm mean, -hmm. um, creating a trusting environment, I mm -hmm. think you said. Yes. The other thing you said very earlier, or early on, is that many of your students have experienced trauma. 
And so I'm thinking that that trauma, you know, can be kind of day to day for many, many people. Yes. And so in thinking about that, um, what opportunities are there for creating hope and resilience as you as you teach your classes? Well, we when an environment when you create safety for someone, and you do that by them knowing that there won't be any repercussions or or punishment, and that is a discussion. What you do is you create a place where people can examine who they are. And that creates safety. And it creates trust. And people can then see that, that they're able to bounce back, as it were. And that's what I, I, that's often the definition of resilience I use with my students, that when things happen and you're able to deal with it, it doesn't mean things aren't going to happen. I mean, the, the law of averages tell me like two-thirds of my students have experienced some form of trauma and violence. The vast majority of my students are female, okay? You put the two together, and then on top of it, um, I've, I've worked with many students who've experienced various forms of oppression. And oppression, because of various, you know, it's in, intersectional, uh, creates another layer of trauma on top of it. So my students learn better if they're in an environment where they feel that, that I trust them and give them choices. And out of that seems to be arising these amazing young people who by the end of the courses embrace better uh, who they are. They embrace um, that they can do it or at least a better idea that they what to do to get to be able to do it. Which I think is probably when you think about when we're supporting folks, and, and it's, it's a major piece of this, so that people are able to see that out of all of this is hope. Because without hope, you don't have a lot of much of anything. And then by building that, it's resilience. So I'm hearing that, and, I, and there's just so many, so many rich words, but I'm hearing that trust and that bounce back and that choice mm -hmm. are such, and safety are such key key ingredients to get to that place of hope that and you were just talking about. And it is. And I've also noted in my work is that if people have, my students, have key places they can find that, then they're, they're able, the, the journey has started. It doesn't have to be in their entire lives to meet that one person. And then the person can take it inside and bring it with them. That one person, two, one person usually means there'll be a second one. You meet a second one, there'll be a third. It gives the person hope that the world is not necessarily the way that you thought it was when you've experienced the trauma, the violence. So I try to be that one person for my students. And I succeed sometimes and sometimes I don't. And what do you most value about yourself in being that, that one person, even if you feel like you haven't measured up? What do, you, what do you most value about yourself in that? I think my own journey through this, too, because as I'm journeying with my students, it's a journey with myself on how to give up some things about me thinking I'm in control, for example, or at least in the classroom. I know I am. I mean, I'm an instructor in some ways, but reality is I can't control all the dynamics. And also, what I value is coming to a place where I truly believe that people are able to do the work. And I say that because I think in society, we still have so many people who believe that they have to do for other people or tell them what to do. We live in a, you know, coming back to how we all got together here, that we live in a culture that's so patriarchal. And by that I mean we are in a, um, a place where some people think they know more than other people. And they want to shape other people's stories. And we see that right now. I mean, with what happened in Puerto Pic and the way the narrative is being told right now, that it mutates and changes. So coming back to my students, 
allowing the reality that more than one reality is possible at one time, because it is. It's possible that more than one truth occurs. And in fact, maybe sometimes it's seven or eight, nine, ten types of truths. And it's not that one is wrong. They all actually are right and valid. And so what I'm hearing, what you most value about yourself is being able to bring in that place of non-judgment and allowing all of those different truths to exist in whatever way they need to. I try to. That seems kind of lofty. But having said that, I, 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 I do my best to do so. And the feedback I get from my students is that they, they feel that way for the most part. So as we walk our journeys and path in the world, compassion will go a long way. Thank you, Dale. Hi. Hi. So you have uh, spent this afternoon listening to us tell our stories about creating space of healing, listening, holding space for other folks. How has that been? It's been profoundly moving. Um, the act of listening deeply, right? It's, um, it's, um, it's a practice, right? It's not, oh, I'm just going to sit in the chair and I'll ask you these questions. But it's about really hearing how, how reflecting back what people are saying can, can um, help to add depth and help to add clarity um, but to listen deeply, um, I think is quite vulnerable. It creates an opening, right? That, that, um, that moves you. You can't do that without, without feeling, without feeling the, the, um, the words that aren't necessarily being said. Um, it opens uh, the, and I think one of the questions I've been asking people is one of, what are the opportunities around hope and resilience? Because that deep listening opens a sense of opportunity. It opens an opportunity for me as listener, as a witness to to be changed. In holding space, I have an opportunity to be changed. Um, I'm not sure what more to say about that than that. Okay, what, what I hear, I, I hear you use the word hope, and I hear you use the word change a lot. So can you talk to me a bit more about what are you hoping for for the people you are deeply listening to? What I'm hoping for them is that, um, that this act of creating this video helps to create um, a sense of being deeply heard, right? That if I can provide that opportunity to deeply hear someone and have that be tangible, that that in and of itself can be an act of healing, that that can be an act of, of um, resistance, right? So, so it's, it's funny because at one point when I was asking the question about hope and resilience, I almost said hope and resistance because resisting, you know, um, um, just being forever lost in the murk and the mire of despair through resilience, right? That I think we have to, um, when something horrible happens, whether that's the mass shooting um, or whether that's living a life where your day-to-day -day experience is um, a combination of small wounds that end up, you know, being a lifetime of paper cuts. That 
wears your spirit down. And so by, by providing an opportunity to listen, to deeply listen, I think allows the spirit to rise again, to come back, to be healed. So that's, I suppose, what, what I hope may have happened in some small way. Can you think of a time when you felt deeply listened to and what that did for you? I think I'm experiencing it right now. I feel like you're listening to me deeply and and that I've had some insights. I've been able to process um, the depth of the emotion and the power of the stories I've heard that I've been able to process a little bit and understand what that means to me. That, that, um, that my experience of being a woman in this culture um, that somehow allows violence to exist to the degree it does. Um, um, my experience of being woman is that, is that culmination of all of those wounds, right? So I don't have one story of a terrible thing that happened to me, um, but I am the culmination of those wounds of not being enough, of being too much. And so having you deeply listening, listening to me allows me to hear my story in the story of others. And can you take just a minute, if you can, and talk a little bit more about the connection between resistance and resilience? <laughs> um, Well, we talk about words like hope and resilience and strength and trust and connection. And I think we can talk about them or we can do them. And doing them is an act of, of um, profound social change. And I think that's what I mean by resistance. Resisting the the implied invitation to stay quiet, resisting the implied invitation to be silent. Um, so yeah, so resistance, hope and resilience, they all tie together into action, maybe. Thank you. I'm so glad that you brought up resistance. <laughs> yeah, and it, because, and I'm teasing that a little more here. Because we've, we've talked about resistance mm -hmm. and we've debated that word a lot in the work that we have done. Mm -hmm. And um, what we haven't talked about yet in the individual interviews is forgiveness. And for me, and I'm just saying keep rolling because this might come into the group discussion. I. Do you see that there might be a connection when we talk about resistance and when we talk about forgiveness? And how do those things live together? I really struggle with the concept of forgiveness. Hugely struggle with it, right? Um, um, but I think where it lives for me, where I've really, where I've been able in thinking about how, you know, despair and hope and forgiveness all tie themselves in. For me, it's about forgiving myself for the times when I have been silent. Forgiving myself for the times when I haven't stepped up or I haven't met my own expectations. Um, forgiving myself for the times when I've had to just go and hide under the covers so that I can get up and, and be my best self tomorrow.